Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining. I think we'll start now. I can see some students are uh, still joining, um, but I think we have a packed event. Uh, and so it would be good to kind of get started, not to delay too much. I will just say a little bit in the beginning and then more or less throughout the event, I will uh, try my best to uh, shut up and not talk and let the more important people talk. I just want to say that I think I'm um, super excited that so many of you joined. I think when I started doing employability like three years ago, um, uh, one of the things I really want to push was um, the placement because I'm a hundred percent a believer in the placement. I think it's an awesome opportunity. I think it gives you something real, real work experience. It gives you a competitive edge when you leave university because you come uh, onto the job market with a huge amount of job experience. And I, I have yet to met a student who said that I did um, a placement and I regret it. And I think you will later hear, hear from one student who basically discovered while on placement that what she did on placement was not really her thing. And she did a kind of a what's that, 180 degree uh, change. And I think still she thinks it was a worthwhile experience. Um, and so I think it's like something we truly believe in as a department that this is really, really good. And you can see it. I think we have each year new record numbers of psychology students going out on placements. We have, I think, three to four times more psychology students going out to placement than micro placements. We have three to four more times students in our psychology students going out compared to economics or sociology or something. And the fit is great for us. I think it's a really good um, kind of opportunity to get great work experience. And so I just want to kind of uh, wholeheartedly endorse it, say like, if you're thinking about it, go for it. Um, sometimes the process might uh, sound a little bit daunting, um, but it's totally doable and you can do it. And this will give you a real great, um, oh yeah, uh, a real great advantage for um, your career. It will help you to explore your interests, get to know yourself a little bit. And I think a lot of students who are coming back, and this is the last thing I say, come back with a different sense of purpose. I think because you realize the stuff we're teaching you is not just stuff for exams or coursework. No, it actually matters. It matters um, in the day-to-day -day life of practitioners of psychology. And I think that gives you a new appreciation of what you're learning. And I think a lot of the placement students who come back to the third year have a very different focus than students who are not a bin on placement. So this is my strong endorsement. I'm super happy. Oh, let me before I before I introduce Trudy, our head of the department, to say some words. And you can see Trudy is here. Uh, she doesn't turn up uh, that often to our events. She has more important things to do. Uh, but that shows you there's a really like um, how much the department is behind this kind of initiatives to push more students to do um, uh, placements. Just a quick outline, and then I pass the mic to Trudy. Um, Trudy will say some words, and then we give basically the chance to the students, because this is what you're here. Uh, we will, I think, start with Malak, then Simran, then Villa, and then Ori. I think the uh, exact order is not that important, but you will hear from four uh, placement students. Then you will hear a little bit from Paul. You will hear from the placement team. And then in the second half, and maybe the most important one, you can ask all the questions you have. Um, and you can ask the students, you can ask me, you can ask Paul. I think you can either use the um, chat function and chat it to everyone, but I think my experience is that you can, sometimes students are a little bit afraid of asking everyone. You can also directly ask me via the chat, and then I'll ask the question for you without uh, revealing your name. If you directly contact me, I assume that you don't want your name to be revealed, and I will just treat it like that. Okay, without further ado, let me welcome Trudy our head of the department, clinical psychologist. So uh, she's uh, not just like me, a useless academic. No, she has a, a valuable place in the world. Trudy, please, um, <laughs> it's all yours. <laughs> I have to say, that's the most bizarre introduction I think I've ever had, because Andreas has a very important role in our department. Um, employability is something that we feel very, very strongly about. And, and the reason I'm here, I do try and come along to quite a few of the events. I know what Andreas is saying, I, but it's, it's the fact that I do take this really seriously. Um, and I want to welcome everybody to this event today. I think it's a perfect opportunity for students to find out sort of that real world experience that the students have had in their placements. And, and again, I think there is that opportunity to be able to ask questions 
in a really sort of uh, in, sort of encouraging environment because it's a it's a big undertaking. But I have to say, in my experience, the, the students that have decided to go on placement um, have benefited enormously in so many different ways. And I think Andrea has actually perfectly expressed the fact that the one thing that we see, it might not necessarily be that it's your choice, but also process of elimination of knowing that that isn't an area, or it might even be that opportunities arise for you, either for research projects in your third year, or the fact of even um, being able to secure a position when you actually finish your degree at university. Um, so I think it's a really wonderful um, sort of initiative. Uh, Paul's been doing some fantastic work supporting the placement students over the last few years. And we, what we can see, uh, particularly with the competitive world that we're living in, it's becoming more and more important to get that experience. And for us as educators, when you come back into your third year, to, for you to be able to bring your knowledge and your experience into all of the modules, everything does um, come alive and it has much more meaning. And our students who've been on placement have taken that decision to sort of almost step out of their trajectory um, of being with their sort of peers and, and their friends and to then come back into a different year. So it's a, it's a big undertaking and a big decision. But the benefits definitely outweigh all of those sort of considerations, but there are practical and, and sort of other issues to consider. So I think that's why this event is so important. Um, I'm really excited about hearing the speakers. Um, I, am, I am actually currently teaching at the moment, so I am going to have to step out, but I will come back. And I'm also going to be watching the recording um, because I'm really interested to sort of hear, as a clinical psychologist, I work you know, in the real world and within the university. Um, and again, I love the fact that we've got people in the department that are absolutely dedicated to supporting your sort of um, career progression and your academic studies and integrating that with research and practice. So I think it's brilliant. I hope you have a fantastic event. And um, I look forward to hearing about sort of more of your talks and experiences, and also the fact that you're going to be inspiring the next sort of cohort um, of students that are going to also go through a similar undertaking. So thank you all for being here. Thank you, Paul and Andreas and the placement team for organizing. Um, and it's been lovely to be able to come and speak to you. So thank you. Thanks, Andreas. All right. Thank you so much, Trudy. That was lovely. One thing I think I want to say before uh, I pass on to uh, Malak is just to say that the idea behind this event is not that we're trying to have a, a propaganda event where we tell you this placements are this kind of flawless experience and this is the best thing ever, etc. I think we want to keep it real and you will hear from uh, all of them like their positive and negative experience so that you can make an informed decision about it. I think we strongly believe that this is great and it's a, a absolute net positive, but I just want to encourage and give all the students also the permission not to feel like, oh, there are aspects that I would like to mention and I would like to share with the students, but I feel like maybe that kind of spoils this. Uh, please do so, right? We want to kind of share honestly the experience we have or you guys had. Um, all right, fantastic. Malak, are you ready? I think I made you the um, co-host. Um, yes. And then I think you could um, just Take over if you want to share something. If I don't know. Oh, fantastic. All right. Um, can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. So hello, everybody. My name is Malak, and I recently completed my uh, placement experience at the Talent Enterprise in Dubai. I've um, copied like their link here uh, if you'd like to read more about them. I just wanted to start by saying that I feel like as students in the university, we're mostly like contained in a jar, um, like the fish you see like in the screen. So I feel like we're just contained in a jar and we're just given information, but we have no idea of what to expect like in the working, uh, in the working world. So that was like the main motive for me to take that um, experience. Okay. So let me start by talking a bit about like why I decided to take the placement and how I secured one. 
So I decided to take a placement because I felt like it was an opportunity for me to develop myself personally and professionally. And it would basically base my CV and potentially uh, help me secure a full-time job faster after I graduate. And this actually did happen since um, like by the end of my placement, um, like my supervisor and the boss, they, they came to me and they offered me like a full-time job uh, for if I want to consider it like after I graduate. Um, I also wanted to expand my professional network. So I always attended like events at City University, but I found this like as another way to expand my professional network. And I surely did. Um, I also wanted to have a view, as I mentioned, of the work life and how it's like, like what to expect after I graduate. And um, to help me narrow down like my career path. Um, so that I can decide like what the, which major I want to pursue for masters. In this case, my placement was organizational psychology. So I was working like with a company, and I find like organizational psychology kind of similar to HR. So we were like um, training people, recruiting people, assessing people. Um, so moving on to how I secured like a place. Um, this was like a long story, but I started by booking an appointment with the careers hub to revise my CV and I booked several mock interviews, which I found very helpful since they taught me how to use the star method when answering like the interview questions and um, yeah, they gave me like different scenarios and what the most like perfect answer could be. Um, I then started looking at different websites that the careers have recommended like indeed or glassdoor to look for a placement um, a placement like yet yeah, secure placement and then i searched companies like um on myself like companies that i was always interested in like walt disney or warner brothers and i think they have several deadlines throughout the year maybe like two deadlines so if you want, like you can have a look at them or any other companies that you're interested in. But my main advice would be apply as soon as possible because with uni, with uni work, like as soon as you're approaching the end of the year, it's gonna be like very hard for you to secure a job. And also like apply to everywhere. I didn't limit myself to one area. So I didn't limit myself to organizational psychology. I initially applied for educational psychology and I secured a job with um, a place called City Year in the UK. Um, but then the pandemic happened and I had to inform them that I can no longer do that and I had to move back to, to live with my family. So about the company that I was working with, as I said, it's called the Talent Enterprise and it's, usual, um, it's mostly like to do with human resource consulting. Um, some of the clients are DHL, Coca-Cola, HSBC, even Harvard Business Publishing School, something like that. Um, they, they, they had several assessments. So for example, um, uh, gamified assessments or surveys or um, yeah, psychological assessments. And they use like behavior metric tools and techniques to provide multidimensional views of an individual. So they basically measured individual markers in which they looked at uh, um, like the employee, uh, employees' strengths, motivations, emotions, cognitions, leadership attributes, and many other areas. And then once they gathered everything, um, depending on what the client wanted us to, to assess or what the client wanted us to um to have like as an outcome for example some of some companies would come to us and they would tell us okay we want you to identify the high potential candidates in our organization so that they can take like more roles or we can pay them more incentives or others would be like we want to know the overall well-being and happiness of employees in our um, organization especially that it was like um covid time um Others use this for succession planning. So this means like when, when, some, when someone retires, for example, from a company, they would like to know who's the most competent person that can go and hold like uh, his position. 
So yeah, these are the, the main things that we were doing. Also career guidance for students and coaching. I know I'm going like a bit fast on this, so you can maybe um, uh, access it through Google. Just type in Google, uh, the talent enterprise and you can read more there. My main tasks, um, I didn't really have a fixed role within the company uh, during like my nine, nine month internship there. But I did work with uh, different teams, for example, the technology team, marketing team, and the project delivery team. I worked on several tasks and um, that was very interesting. I feel like uh, it's usually more interesting for a student to, do, to be involved in more than one thing than just focusing on one thing. So some of my tasks were um, creating like an e-learning course. I had all the content ready, but they just wanted me uh, to bring it to life, basically. Um, translating lots of assessments, creating assessments, um, doing some research, report building creation of um, assessor forms. So these are the forms that assessors might use when, um, yeah, when like uh, uh, employing people and uh, preparation of demo videos and many other things. And some of you might be wondering, like, what does that have to do with your, um, with your field, like as an organizational psychologist? But um, the company did involve me on both ends of organizational psychology. For example, in the back end, I was responsible for creating a number of competency-based assessments. And in the front end, I was responsible for scoring hundreds of candidates as part of the selection process. Um, this was mainly done in, in groups. Like uh, I wasn't the only one scoring the candidates. Uh, more than one would score like the candidates to have like an inter-rated reliability. And finally, what I've learned. So, I've learned like a lot of things that developed my skills personally and professionally, but I didn't want to focus on that. I wanted to focus on like what I've learned in general. A very important thing that I've learned is that it's very important for us to have a, a, a positive attitude whenever we try something new and um, a can-do attitude basically. So many times you would be given tasks that you don't feel comfortable doing or that are out of your comfort zone. For example, let's say public speaking or anything that has to do with technology. So it's very important for you to have um, a positive attitude towards these things because um, like, that's the way that you're gonna learn more and yeah, you're gonna have like a, a, positive, um, like a positive image for your company. And um, I also, I also get, got like an insight on which skills I'm good at and which skills I need to develop further. And that was really insightful because when I'm thinking about like applying to, uh, to future jobs, if I don't want to continue with them in the future, like I need to develop some of the skills that um, I was aware that I was a bit lacking on, but um, yeah. And uh, I also got an insight on my working preferences. For example, I noticed that I really like the flexible working. I don't like going to the office maybe like um, all days a week, or I don't like working at home um, all days a week. So yeah, I really like the flexible environment and um, I, I like teamwork, I like individual work. So it can give you an idea of what are the things you like so that when you apply for future jobs, you can be like happier and less stressed that way. Um, also a very important thing, which I wasn't very good at, <laughs> is like drawing limits. So as interns, they might, uh, they might like overload you with, inf um, with tasks. Um, and it's important like for you to, to make it clear for them how much you've got on your plate and how much more you can take. Yeah, so for me that was a bit difficult, and uh, it made um, it might it made my placement a bit more stressful, like towards the end. So yeah, just draw your limits and be polite with them. Like just tell them how much you've got, just uh, to let them know, and you would hopefully ex uh, enjoy your experience better then. Yeah, that was all for me. Um, just let me know if you have more questions.
All right, great. Thank you so much, Malak. I think if it's fine with you, we have um, at the end like an open kind of question round, and I think it would be good. Maybe we can just do the um, the questions then, um, and I would just pass it on to Simran. It's kind of a nice transition because in some ways she always ended or she ended up doing what you did during your placement, but she did something very different in her placement. Um, all right, Simran, can I uh, encourage you to take over? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and firstly, I just a disclaimer, my slideshow and information is nowhere near as detailed and great as Malik was. So just a heads up, um, I'm just sharing my screen. Has that loaded okay? All good? Great. great. Yep. Thank you. Um, yeah, so this feels like forever ago now, <laughs> as Paul will remember. Um, I want to say 2018, I think it was. Yeah, I started my, um, so I was at City doing my undergraduate degree in psychology, um, which I ended up doing a pathway version of. So it was psychology with neuroscience in the end. And um, when it got to my second year, I decided that it would be good um, to do a placement. I was kind of hearing about it from the SAS team. I saw some posts going out and I'd heard of like kind of other people doing some placements. But I don't feel at that time there was kind of that much awareness of it and that much going on around it. But I was kind of in a place where I didn't really know exactly what I wanted to do. I was, as most psychology students are, came in like, I'm going to be a clinical psychologist. Clinical psychology is everything. Um, so I was like, yeah, straight narrow path. That's what I'm going to do. And then I'm so glad that somehow in my head, it was like, maybe I should figure out what it's actually like a bit more before I decide to dedicate the rest of my life to this very long very difficult career path. Um, so I wanted to experience clinical psychology as much as I could before committing to it, because obviously, um, as some of you may know, it does like it's an amazing pathway to do and, and has great kind of career options, but it also takes a lot of time, dedication, free work, um, and it, it's just a lot. So it's good to know if it's something you actually want to do. So I was having a light look kind of online for organizations that were offering it. Um, and then the SAS placements team actually sent out an email um, for the Islington Learning Disability Partnership um, based in Drayton Park. So not too far from, from City um, for a one year long placement as an honorary assistant psychologist. And um, they kind of advertised this as there were two posts. It was kind of you get to have experience working with adults with learning disabilities. Um, you would work in kind of treatment plans, et cetera. So it sounded like a really good opportunity to get kind of a rich insight into this. And I was like, yes, this is exactly what I want. So um, kind of applied with my CV cover letter um, and ended up actually doing an interview with them, um, which at that stage, I'd only kind of done retail interviews and stuff. So it was quite nerve wracking, especially when I walked in and there were like three, there was two psychologists that in front of me and someone else, I think, um, maybe a care worker or someone else in, in the team was sat there and it was like three of them in front of me when I only expected one and they were kind of handing me um, laminated questions to hold for each question and I was like okay just breathe but um, it was a good experience to have so got it in the end. Um, so the placement was one year long and during this I mean we there was myself and one other student from City and we did um, a huge amount of stuff. I mean, it was something where we kind of, I went into it and I was like, okay, like at the level I'm at as a student, I'll probably get to look at some things they're doing, but I don't, I didn't really think I'd get to get as involved as I did. Um, so we started off with a lot of learning, kind of um, sitting in on supervision sessions that, um, and like sessions that the um, clinical psychologists at the service had with service users, had a look at the kind of treatment plans they put together. Um, and then we started to actually get involved ourselves. So it was a multidisciplinary team set up there. So they had um, clinical psychologists, they had um, a psychiatrist, they had social workers, occupational therapists, everyone kind of in the same place, which was really nice because say they're working on one um, service user one individual's kind of treatment plan they can just go between each other to say okay we need this incorporated and this incorporated and it also meant for myself I got a lot of exposure to all these different roles and how they kind of work together in offering this clinical psychology service um, to the people that they worked with so 
what we did is we kind of got some training from our supervisor um, and we learned core kind of principles um, and training methods and techniques behind things like CBT, DBT. And we got to um, learn a lot more about kind of the, the treatments and therapies that they offered. And then we actually started being able to kind of administer it ourselves which was really cool um obviously under supervision and then it got to the point where I had four service users assigned to myself that I was working directly with so I would meet them regularly once a week um I would kind of line out things we could do create goals with them and work towards these I would put together events and plans um things for them to do to kind of improve their well-being and, and to work towards um obviously having a better better lifestyle and um, there was one amazing case I had where I was working with someone one-to-one -one and um, it was kind of we had a breakthrough where he started to communicate be a lot more open which is something they hadn't managed before so it was really nice to kind of feel like I was making an impact um, and we had kind of regular supervision sessions as well which were really helpful and um, we kind of ran our own events there and got people involved so it was a really really intense and really hands-on placement where um, I honestly got to do so much which I'm very very grateful for but kind of ultimately having done the placement I realized clinical psychology wasn't the route for me to go down um, as much as I learned from it which I, I really really did um, I also learned okay I, I love to help people and I, I'd love to get involved in that stuff but it's not something I want to do as a career path and I realized out of it what I did like were kind of the organizational aspects so I liked how the team was structured as a multidisciplinary team where everyone needed was kind of under one roof I liked to see what resources they had in place for the employees who work in such intense roles um, because obviously kind of from this I just really learned how important the staff of any organization are for the kind of success of that organization so I kind of sat back and I was like oh okay so I don't want to do clinical psychology and that is what my placement in clinical psychology revealed to me so was it a waste of time um, but it definitely was not a waste of time because if I had not done it I would probably be applying for a clinical doctorate right now for the third year in a row so um, I'm really glad that I did it I learned so much about um, the work of clinical psychologists themselves, but also learned that my interest lies a lot more um, in a different area, but I didn't actually know organizational psychology existed or that it was even a thing. I only knew Paul, who was my placement coordinator and would come out to visit me on placement. I knew he was an organizational psychologist, but I had no idea what it actually was. And then I kind of looked into it a little bit more. And then another amazing um, placement was going out from uni but it was actually um, an internship rather than a placement for um, Silicon Valley Bank or a financial tech bank and it was in their HR department and I kind of looked at it and I was like oh this is quite related to organizational psychology like maybe it's time to finally delve into a different area of psychology rather than clinical so I took that up um, in my final year and realized that I really enjoyed the kind of organizational aspects of things. So I've just finished my master's in organizational psychology um, and I'm working somewhere else now in, in a related field where I'm working in learning and development, et cetera. So it's really, really good. But I think my kind of takeaway that I would give to you all if you are considering um, doing a placement is absolutely do it. I know I'm biased, but I think it's just such an amazing way to get a feel of the area you think you're interested in um, and also just of actual working life because <clears throat> part-time jobs and like the retail positions that you'll do during uni, yes, they let you learn kind of about time management and, and working somewhere, but actually having um, like a, a full-time role somewhere that's something you're interested in will make you realize kind of what actually is involved what do I need to dedicate to this what do I need to do to work towards it because obviously you'll meet people already in the field while you're on placement they'll give you so much more insight and advice and guidance so um I definitely wouldn't be where I am today without having done the placement because I probably still wouldn't know what I want to do um so I think the biggest takeaway is just see it as an amazing opportunity and it's one thing that City I think apart like aside from other universities does because I know a lot of my friends and people at other unis didn't get the opportunity and their unis didn't have the same connections with great organizations to do such a range of um, kind of placements now and I actually get quite jealous seeing the placements people would students are doing at City now because they did not exist when I was there so I just think absolutely take that opportunity and um, and do it. 
it'll be good. That's all from me. All right, thank you so much. I think the first placement, uh, Paul is clapping. I think it's always a little uh, tricky uh, uh, virtually to express our gratitude. I remember the first placement event I organized and Paul, I, Paul and I organized and you were there and all the things you told us during that event that you did during your placement. And I was like, that, I, can't, I really remember saying like, that's what they allowed you to do. Didn't you, inter you basically selected the person that came after you, you did interviews and- Yeah, yeah, we, oh, sorry, I should mention that. Yeah, we held oh. the interview process and screening and everything for um, the, the people who went into the placement after us, which was really cool exposure to get to. Realized I like that too, related to organizational psychology. So it all tied in some way or another. Yes. So I think that, I mean, ideally you discovered during the placement that you love exactly that, but it was amazing the range of things you did. Um, I was, uh, uh, at that time, I was really shocked that you were just like, oh, this is like, wow, you really work okay. <laughs> so uh, I would really remember that. That was all before, I think, the pandemic. Um, all right. Thank you so much, Samran. If you have any questions, just hold them for now, and then um, we'll move on. I think it's uh, on my, it says Vida on my, I can't, I have to find you, Vida. Um, oh, you're there. Let me see you. <laughs> Okay, and if it's cool, I would just pass the mic to you and um, yeah, tell us about your placement. No problem. Hi everyone, hopefully you can all hear me. Yes, amazing. Thank you, Paul. The thumbs up are extremely helpful. I'm just going to try. Ah, I can't share screen and Andreas is gone, so that's not helpful. Uh, yeah, hold on, a t hold on a tick. Let me see if I can make you co-host, uh, Vida. Uh... Oh, he's back. Yeah. Andres, can you make uh, Vida co-host? Co Sorry, my uh, uh, the, the door rang. Yes, of course. Why can't I do this? Okay. Um, okay. Can you check if you can share now? I can, yes. Okay. Amazing. Sorry. Thank you. Brilliant. Hopefully everyone can see my screen. Amazing. Yes. Thank you so much, Paul. Yes. All right, so I'm just going to do this. So, hi everyone, my name's Wida. I'm going to be talking about my placement experience at Likewise. Um, so, quickly, just going to be talking about. So, I need to rearrange something here. Um, sort of the how I got to getting onto placement. So, I always knew I wanted to do a sandwich year. I was in my second year of university and I just thought I need a break. I can't do third year in the mindset that I'm in right now. I need to do something different. I need a bit of a break. Um, and if you haven't, I'm sure you've already heard, if you have Andreas as a lecturer, you've heard of placements because he talks about them all the time, which is amazing and really important um, because I think a placement is a brilliant thing to do. So originally I was sort of going on along the lines of going on an exchange year abroad, but of course coronavirus happened. So I veered towards a placement very quickly because I wanted to do something. I also want to become a clinical psychologist. It is not something new. Um, it's just something that I've always wanted to do. I attended an event with um, that city was actually hosting alongside Likewise. So a representative from Likewise came over and, and held an event, told us all about them, what they do. And I found it really interesting. There were a bunch of psychology students there, lots of my friends there, we all just went, we attended and it was really great, it was online. And um, through that, it's sort of how I found Likewise itself. But I, <laughs> as you can see, I've got a high sim run written at the bottom of my PowerPoint because I actually applied for the mentor program that city does mentor mentorship program and Simon was actually my mentor life coach advisor for like the few months that I was trying to find a placement at city which ultimately is one of the biggest reasons why I was able to secure a placement I'm going to get onto that in a moment and I do mean that sincerely um she looked up a lot of things for me I'm going to talk about them in my tips section in just a moment but for now I'm going to talk about what my actual placement was at likewise so it's a mental health charity and community center based in Camden in London so they have a central hub over there where they normally outside of COVID times hold a lot of events. So they had things like a global cafe, they have a, um, a cafe sort of um, workshop session that they do for women, refugees and children there. They have one to one sessions that they do with their clients, which is mainly what I was involved in because of COVID, their group sessions were sort of put on hold. So I was doing things like working frontline with clients face to face one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one -on -one. I was with my supervisors so most, sometimes at the beginning mostly 
working with a variety of clients from a variety of backgrounds. So um, I had around um, seven, eight clients around my time when I was there and they all varied in sort of their age, gender orientation, and if they had any sort of what their needs were, what their goals were, any sort of um, problems they had, health issues, mental health problems that they, were, they had as well. I worked with an older lady with bipolar disorder. I worked with um, a younger gentleman with autism and schizophrenia. And I would go to these people's houses and I would spend an hour a week, two hours, three hours a week with them in their homes or in community centers with them, um, basically spending time with them, um, whatever they sort of wanted to do. Um, it could be going on walks. They were, could be learning how to cook because they wanted to someone's unmuted just letting you know um, <laughs> um oh i've completely lost myself so um yeah a variety of um clients i was sort of working with at that time and it was sort of a blend of social work counseling and mental and emotional support um so a lot of sort of working with people working towards their goals um not helping them but being with them and doing things with them which was a big thing and likewise we're not helping we're not doing for, we're doing with. So really going towards working with people's goals. And I received a lot of formal training as well during my time at Likewise. So I got the mental health first aid. Um, that was done online as well. It was This was all during COVID, my placement. So um, it was these things are formal training. Care certificate, which is a standard set by Health um, Department England, Skills for Care and Skills for Health, which is something that all social workers need in order to become social workers, the care certificate. And I got British Cross um, Everyday First Aid training as well. Um, but despite the fact that we were in COVID times, I was still spending four days a week out in person, traveling to people's homes, one or two clients every single day. I had my face mask, I had my gloves, and I had my plastic apron, and I'd be staying in their homes and being with them. Um, sort of that's sort of the stuff that I was doing so it was really really intense I had supervision every week which was just an hour for me to talk to my supervisor which I didn't think I needed at first but after a few months of working in that environment I realized that it was really important for me to have my own supervision sessions as well we had group sessions so as much as we could we worked with other people it was a lonely job at the end of the day though because at most I would meet my supervisor in person to be with the clients and then that was it and um, because of COVID times of course I didn't meet a lot of my colleagues it was mostly online but um, that's all the stuff that I was doing over there um, really broad there was also a little bit of an admin aspect as well so things like note taking meeting minutes I wrote down quite a lot reports on client interactions things like that sometimes occasionally had to reach out to third services on behalf of clients or help them to reach out to third services themselves I had this one client who wanted to move homes so we had to look at a lot of counseling letters there was another client that had an issue with um, personal independent payment PIP disability allowance another one that had issues picking up their medicine just little things like that helping people remember the little things that they needed to do when I would meet them every week I would say how did your you know your shock go how did you did you remember to take your medicine little things like that um but mostly yeah it was just being with people people orientated um which I think is one of the biggest benefits of the placement that I did was relationship building it was difficult because I was getting to know these people which is amazing and also really hard as well because of all the struggles that they were going through it was um a big lesson for me to learn to not internalize that as well so um, I talked about this before. I had one particular client who over the course of a few months, I saw slowly um, veered towards conspiracy theories regarding COVID. Um, so at first it was sort of COVID is exaggerated, then the government's sort of making it up and then hospital deaths aren't that big. And actually it's all linked to the new world order. And eventually he ended up joining a cult and having a psychotic episode. This wasn't in front of me, but it was something that I knew this person, I knew this older man, you know, he was living alone at home and it was difficult to see things like that happening in front of me, but also it was quite rewarding as well. I mean, I had this particular client who I worked with who I personally just felt like I didn't get along with that well at first. It was quite difficult to engage with him, but I went to his house every single week. He would always say to me all the time that, you know, likewise is useless, you're not helping me, but he would open his door every week and he would let me in. And eventually those sorts of things would open up and build a relationship. And we started learning about his interests thinking about maybe when things open up a little bit more, he could join a literature club, things like that. So really, really beneficial and built up a lot of my skills 
you can see that display in development of skills and development of self. So first of all, development of skills, soft and hard skills. I know those are all like fancy terms that I'm throwing at the moment. I'm sure you all know what those are, but communication, active listening is so, so, so important. These are things that I've built up presentation as well. We had to present every two weeks. We have a group session where we'd have to present our problem. We had to talk about it for eight minutes. And you can imagine how difficult it is talking about one problem for eight minutes, but we had to do it was something that we did at the at placement itself. It was a learning job. They had over 50 students at Likewise every single year. So they're really, really on board with everything they do. It's a learning job all the time. And obviously the transferable skills. If you haven't heard the Citizen Employability Award, go and check that out right now because um, it's really, really beneficial. It's something you're actually going to be working on during your placement, actually. So um, I didn't know we were genuinely applying for it until right at the end, but there was things that you have to do during your placement. Obviously, I won't go into that a little too much right now because you're still sort of tentative, but really look at those transferable skills and look up the sort of things that they're on. There are about 10 of them. And at the end of my placement, luckily, I was awarded with the Gold Level Employability Award, which is the highest level that they, thank you, Paul. Um, uh, so it's really, really amazing. You can learn so much from there and you can develop so much as well. But also there's development of self, which was the bigger thing for me. It was a lot of self-awareness, big, big self-awareness. Paul was there with me through my journey. So he knows exactly how much I struggled and what I went through in the end and how I turned out in the end as such a completely different person to who I was. When I started that placement, there was a lot of realizations. Um, even small things like I'm not introverted, I'm actually extrovert. I like being around people, I need to be around people. I can't be on my own and I hate online learning and I hate um, working remotely. I need to be in a place, but also that I don't like traveling between locations. I just wanna go somewhere and I sit maybe in an office. It's, you know, little things like this that I've realized that I really need and I want. Um, that I've realized I don't really want to do um, anything along the lines of social work or counseling either. So sort of similar to where Simran is. And I remember she told me exactly the same thing when she was my mentor. She was like, I was like you, I wanted to do clinical and I did my um, placement. I want to go to organizational. I feel like I'm going along the same path. I'm looking towards things like HR or research internships rather than psychology related. I'm even considering becoming a lecturer. I say this at my own risk. Andres is my lecturer for one of my modules. I'm going to hear a lot from him now. I think hopefully but little things like that but just change of my future goals that I don't really want to go into social work or counseling maybe clinical but we'll see how that goes I'm um, just quickly going on to tips now I realize I've taken up a lot of time um, university resources so I've spoken I've said this about four times now use the mentorship program if you can apply for it Simran was a really big help she did interview practice with me she checked my CV she improved my CV she checked my cover letters as well but of course all of these things exist outside of the mentorship program CETA careers is absolutely amazing please 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 do make use of them I say start looking now not to pressure you but you do need to be looking I think Malak mentioned this earlier that they have deadlines all spread out through the year it is true I got lucky I managed to apply to something a little bit later and get there quite early but it's not it was a special um thing that city had to do with likewise because we have a partnership with them otherwise you will be need to start applying from January I would say is maybe where the big deadlines are look in multiple places I got rejected from a few places before I got into likewise so you need to be keep applying for places anything that takes your interest essentially just apply and go and you'll learn more about them through the interviews and the selection workshops that they have and of course attend events I found out about likewise through a city event I would never have heard of them ever in my entire life without it but all my other placements that I found I found them on Indeed I found them on Read and I found them on LinkedIn um, LinkedIn is a really big one use all the resources that you have and I wrote be proactive which is super vague but I will go into detail apply for everything that interests you and I, when I say follow up I don't just mean a follow up on the places that you applied for if you get rejected follow that up as well it's something that I was really scared to do but I actually sent an email to one of the places that rejected me and I just asked them hey you know you always give placements to students I hope you wouldn't mind taking a few minutes to tell me what I did that what I did wrong or what I was lacking that didn't get me into your placement um, as a student so that I can improve next time they actually got back to me with a lot of details one of the things I remember they said is that you don't have enough experience in X, Y, Z field, which I think, OK, I didn't have a lot of control over, but that's fine. They said something about my CV that I was missing percentage grades for most, some of the modules on my year ending. So they couldn't actually see what my grades were at university, which is just little things like that, which helped me that I've improved my CV on already. Follow up and things like that. Ask questions at events. If anything, just to get you noticed, I sent a follow up email to likewise afterwards. And I was just like, hey, I was a person that asked this question. I really enjoyed your um 
um, uh, event that you sort of um, hosted, yada yada, things like that, just to get yourself noticed, to get yourself out there and show a lot of vigor. Again, follow up emails, um, a lot of energy, hand gestures <laughs> and things like that when you're applying. Um, it's going to really help you out. And of course, just best of luck in the end to all of you that are applying as well. I would really say go for it. It's honestly the best thing I've ever done in my life and I've changed so much because of it. Um, and I think that's all from me. All right, fantastic. Yeah, thank you so much. Crazy for me that you, that you thought you were an introvert, but <laughs> well, there we go. I've realized. Um, yes, fantastic. That was really, really good. I mean, um, yeah, what a coincidence that uh, Simran was your um, a mentor as well. Um, <laughs> all right, I see RA, and I would pass on to RA and kind of replay if that's all right and i think i mean at least as much as i know or you did clinical psychology and you're still committed to clinical psychology so it doesn't mean that you do something in clinical psychology and you leave the field so uh that kind of i think uh uh i can already kind of uh, reveal all right i would just let you do i think i made you i think you can share your screen right um, um yes all right fantastic and we can see the slides hey hi everyone oh someone is okay yeah. well, we'll I, this, uh, oh. could you put your microphone on mute thanks yeah where you go Ori. cool Hi everyone, my name is Aura, um, and I did my placement at Islington Learning Disabilities Partnership, the same place as Simran, so I don't want to repeat too much of what she says, so I might just skip over some of the things that I have here. Um, but in terms of finding my placement, um, so I kind of always knew I wanted to do a placement, like in college I was aware of sandwich years and all of that. Um, but I kind of solidified my interest in doing the placement through talks like these ones um, and the careers department have a lot of resources on their website. Um, but I also did a micro placement and I got a lot of information about placement years through doing that as well. Um, so in terms of my specific placement, um, while I say I was interested in doing a placement, I was also apprehensive about doing one um, I just didn't know if I wanted to take a year out. Um, I didn't know if I could afford it. Um, I just thought I wanted to finish my degree quickly and kind of figure out my life afterwards. Um, but I also knew that being a clinical psychologist, it's imperative to get um, experience. So I thought I would regret it if I didn't at least try and apply. So I kind of, I didn't put my full effort into applying to a placement. And I think I'm lucky that I even secured one in the first place. But anyway, um, Andreas actually sent out the advertisement for IODP. Um, and I applied for that literally the day of the deadline. So I don't, I'm not endorsing any of that. Um, but yeah, I luckily secured that placement. Um, I don't know how, but I did. Um, so as Simran did mention, IODP um, is an organization that works with people with a learning disability, and it is a multidisciplinary team. So you have basically everyone, social workers, care workers, psychiatrists, um, but I worked in the psychology team. Um, and my role initially was quite different from Simran, and I'm thinking it's because of the pandemic. Um, I'm not sure if they were quite ready to have a placement online. So initially my roles were very admin-based, report writing, taking minutes, um, you know, having some sort of, I don't even know, it, it was quite admin-based. And I was regretting doing a placement at that time because it just wasn't what I had signed up for. So I took it upon myself to take the initiative and literally beg for a bit more um, work. Um, so luckily I was then able to, in my second half, get a bit more client contact, um, which is what I wanted in the first place. 
So luckily I was able to have, you know, engage in some one-to-one -one contact with clients after the pandemic slowly died down. I got to meet them face-to-face -face and engage in some narrative therapy. Um, I was able to also engage in cognitive assessments um, psychometric assessments, basically, um, th these are like tests that determine whether someone meets the criteria for um, a global learning disability. Um, I also engaged in systemic therapy training. Um, and uniquely, I definitely engaged in service development. Um, so my placement occurred a few months after George Floyd's murder and the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and you know, that's when all these companies are like, okay, now we can be anti-racist. Um, so this organization definitely did that. Um, and it kind of came across very performative and disingenuous. Um, and it just didn't sit well with me at all, um, especially on an organization that works with people of various races, you would think um, you would want someone to be genuine and, you know, being anti-racist. Um, so I made it known to them in a professional manner to, um, you know, if you need any assistance or you want my input, I'm here to help you, um, you know, because it's important that you have cultural competency and, you know, aware of how someone's race and culture can impact their mental health and, you know, their livelihood. Um, so I took a big leadership role in that end of things. Um, and hopefully they benefited from it and are still using some information I kind of told them about today. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the main roles that I was involved in. Um, in terms of what I learned on the job, I definitely developed confidence in my abilities. I think going into it, I, well, I kind of am still working on my confidence and abilities and whether I can actually be a psychologist. Um, but from the feedback I got from my supervisors and you know the clients that I work with, saying that I kind of made an impact on their life, I, I'm working on that. I, I'm beginning to believe it a, a bit. Um, I definitely learned crucial information about being a psychologist in terms of how to achieve it. Um, it's a pretty long path to get there and to get on the doctorate. And it kind of did make me a bit apprehensive at first, but I mean, I am committed to it for now. I mean, we'll see <laughs> about, you know, the rejections I might get. We'll see about that in the later, but yeah, I'm working on that path anyway. Um, time management, organizational skills. I'm sure everyone is aware of how important that is. Um, but also working from home, you, you learn how important it is to have boundaries and kind of learn about your work-life balance, um, especially being unpaid and kind of working with some top-notch people. You think you have to like overwork to prove yourself. And I definitely was a victim of that. I, you know, I work nine to five, but sometimes I would work until 7 p.m. And I'm like, what am I actually doing? I'm not getting paid. Um, it's just important to know boundaries and to keep yourself healthy and, you know, yeah, it's very important. Um, and also it prepared me for the real world, um, especially about the doctorate and, you know, the acceptance rates, especially for people of color. Um, my supervisor kindly kind of let me in on some information about, you know, people of color are like only 2% likely to get accepted into the doctorate. And I'm like, okay, that's not a good, I mean, it's not good for me, but yeah, I just got an insight into a lot of things that I didn't know beforehand. Um, so I'm a bit more aware of what I need to do to, in order to achieve my goals in the long run. Um, but I'll leave you with some tips. As everyone said, it's important to start looking now for a placement year. Don't wait until the last minute like I did. Um, do research on the kind of role you want to complete and make sure the organization kind of suits your needs and values. Um, also make the most out of your placement, make connections. I'm still in contact with my supervisors and, you know, it's just important nowadays it's about who you know, um, and that is really important. Um, but yeah, hopefully that was helpful for you guys. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ari. Yes, okay. That I think in some ways kind of mirrors a little bit 
Um, I think if you can stop sharing the screen, some of the things you said that I like, do that? Are, I think you should, like there's a stop thing in the middle, but I can also, let me. Oh, I got it, thanks. Okay. Um, yes, that sometimes placement starts a little bit slow. I heard, especially in clinical statement uh, placements, I sometimes hear that people are saying, ah, oh, there's not that much to do, not that much to do. And I always say like, you have to go on an initiative, do something. Uh, and one of my students, I think, uh, uh, Mohammed, he had a very different, I thought it was interesting because he basically realized that a lot of doctors in, um, uh, in the area where he was living, uh, where he was working, there was a lot of clients who were from, or had a Bangladeshi background and the doctors were uh, from a different background and there was a lot of cultural problems and interactions. And he took that on and said like, okay, I wanna do something very much like you did and kind of try to educate the doctors a little bit. And he started to have these workshops about educating uh, the, kind of, yeah, uh, white female uh, um, clinical psychologist about what it means, um, or what it means in uh, a different culture to think about learning disabilities and um, uh, the maybe uh, some kind of um, stigma that is to attach to that and so forth. So I think it's kind of like it really resonated because I think there's just like it's quite common that sometimes the um, placement might start a little bit slow. Paul, I think, thank you so much, uh, Ori, for sharing. That was really good. Um, and then I think, um, Paul, it's you, isn't it? Yes. Okay. Let me just see if I can get you bigger. Okay. And please go ahead. Thanks, Andreas. Yeah. And thanks um, to the speakers. Absolutely fantastic. I think the university is so proud of the contributions you've made and the way you've developed it's just ah oh, brings a tear to my eye seeing you all talk about these things again so um my name is paul flaxman i'm uh, the psychology academic placement coordinator and i'm just going to say a little bit quite briefly about what i do but if you're interested you can um you can follow up with me uh, andreas your tapping is uh, thanks yeah um so what's my role um well, the first thing that I tend to do is look at the placement opportunity you found for yourself, just to make sure it is uh, relevant for psychology. Uh, to be honest, nearly everything can be relevant for psychology. So that's quite an easy part of my job, really. If you find uh, something looking at organizational psychology, like learning and development or counseling, clinical or educational working in a school, something like that. Uh, or with learning disabilities, of, as we've seen, uh, all relevant for psychology, of course. The other big part of my job is I conduct uh, mid-placement and end-of-placement reviews and meetings. So mid-placement, I'll meet with you and your placement uh, supervisor. We'll just talk about what you've been doing and any ways you've developed. Um, yeah, it can seem a little bit scary to have someone from the university come in and hear what you've been doing, but it's really focused on your development. So asking you to think about how you developed in the role. Um, another thing I've found myself doing, which I'm very happy to do, is writing job references for ex-placement students, just because I see an aspect of you if you go on placement that perhaps the, the normal lecturers won't see. So I see the way your confidence develops. I see the skills you develop on placement. So. Um, I'm very happy to write references for students who've been on placement when they go off for postgraduate training or um, to jobs. If you're wondering where you might get a placement, uh, I just picked a few from the last few years where our students have been on placement, just to show you the diversity really. Um, so we've got places like NHS services, like uh, Tower Hamlets Learning Disability Team, uh, likewise, where Widow was, uh, which is a charity supporting local community in London. Uh, and just have a look down there. You see some organizational psychology ones like PwC. Disney was an organizational HR uh, placement. Um, yeah, I mean, you can have a look at the list your, yourself. Some of these come back to us every year. So people like Likewise, Tower Hamlets, ILDP, uh, where Simran uh, was where Aura was, they tend to come back to us every year just because our students do a fantastic job, to be honest. So they always come back to us. Uh, City Year is another one which is based in schools, offering mentorship to uh, school pupils. 
uh, which is a really uh, a really strong placement to have. Take Two Interactive was a software company, a gaming company actually, and one of our ex students worked in a HR role in Take Two Interactive. That was a fantastic experience. Yeah, but you can see there's a wide range of options uh, for a psychology placement. I've got some learning here that I've picked up from the reviews, but I think it really echoes what um, you know our speakers have been saying, what Malak and Simran, Aura and Wida have been saying. Um, I think that top tip about being proactive is from the beginning. So you look, you look for your placement opportunity. Don't just expect it to be given to you. You know, go out there and look and find out ways to identify where you might find a placement. And then when on placement, absolutely maximizing the opportunity. So picking up certificates, uh, developing learning, getting involved in projects, even asking to get involved in projects is a fantastic thing to do, particularly if you're feeling dissatisfied with some of the tasks that you're doing. It's worth communicating that and asking to do other things. The initial stages can be quite challenging. So you have to learn to shift from being a student to being a professional. So that often means, you know, nine to five working again, which might be a shock to the system. But nearly always it's worth sticking it out. Uh, yeah, nearly always you just keep going and you find at the end you're absolutely delighted that you, you did stick it out. Um, another thing is being willing to experience some discomfort al along the way, you know, like I, I really like what Widow was saying about um, learning to work one to one with clients can bring up some discomfort when you're not particularly confident to begin with or finding it difficult to build rapport. Uh, but that's a great skill. I write that a lot in the reports about how people have developed this willingness to be uncomfortable in order to pursue goals at work. It's absolutely fantastic. The contributions are amazing to the services. They, I still get feedback from these services about how our students have changed the ways of working at the service. Uh, ILDP, classic example with Aura and Simran. Um, responsibility tends to increase in the second half. So you might find you don't have a lot of client responsibility, maybe the first half, but that tends to change once trust is developed between you and uh, the placement provider. And I can say, because I see this, is the personal and professional development is remarkable. What you see from the beginning of the placement in the student to the end. I mean, the fact that these four students have just popped up here without much, without much preparation to do these presentations, how confident they are presenting. You know, I suspect if you'd asked them at the beginning of the placement, this would have filled them with horror and they might not know how to go about doing this, but they've had no help from me and they just popped up and done this. So. Yeah, it's just such a, uh, a privilege for me to see people develop over this year. So that's what I'd really recommend it for, a remarkable personal and professional development. I'm going to shut up now because I'd like to hand over to Fiona from the placements team who knows all about the practicalities. But yeah, if anything I've said uh, interests you, do feel free to drop me an email and I'd be happy to respond. Thanks, Paul. Can everyone hear me? Uh, give me ah, a, fantastic. give me one sec and I'll just yes. I'll make you big. Um, oops, oh, where's my goal? So, Gary, there you are, and then replace pin, and now you're big, and then I think you should be able to share a screen if you want to. Here we go. There we go. Let's start. So, I just want to share. I've got five minutes, but I want to share. Um, I met uh, Wida some time ago. I actually met her probably uh, beginning of 2020 uh, when we were interviewing for our exchange program. And um, she was very nervous that day. And I haven't really spoken to her in person or seen her in person until today. And it's just so lovely to see how much the experience of going on placement has developed her personally. She's so much more calm and confident. Um, and I just want to um, remind everybody that this is one of the huge benefits of this program is your personal development that will have really positive outcomes for your whole life. Um, and it'll give you an edge over other students who don't choose to do this program. So I would again, encourage you to take on one of these work placements. So um, before we get started, I just wanna let you know that I'll be sending out a PDF of all of this presentation. So you don't need to take notes, uh, just listen. 
Uh, and um, we'll just go into a little bit about uh, what you need to do now um, and what you need to do after that. So uh, let me um, continue. So my name is Fiona Gibson. I'm an employability and student mobility officer in the school. Um, and our team pretty much looks after our two premier um, sandwich year programs. So it's their exchange program and the work placements program, which I'm gonna talk about today. Um, I have uh, two colleagues in my team. There's Eleanor and Roma. You may have spoken to Roma before, um, but we can all help you out. Um, Eleanor's on maternity leave and she'll be back at the beginning of next year. So the Integrated Professional Training Program, which is what our work placements program is called, adds an additional year of study to your degree. So it turns three years into four years and it sits between year two and year three. The really great thing about it is that it maintains your student status while you're on this program. So it means you get all of the benefits of being a student, things like um, travel benefits, um, you know, all, all of the associated um, uh, positives to being a student. So this is what it looks like. You complete year two and then you go out for your, your sandwich year program in this case, a work placement. And then once you've completed that year, you come back and you do year three. You're all eligible to apply if you're in year two. You just need to make sure that you pass all of your year one and your year two modules. And of course, you need to find your own work placement. And we recognize this program on your transcript when you have uh, finished here at City, and it's your degree title with integrated professional training. So it shows prospective employer that you have added an extra year to your studies and you have put yourself out there and been really motivated and got some good work experience as well. Um, and the other thing is it needs to be a nine to 12 month full-time role and in most cases paid. Now for psychology students, probably about 75% are unpaid, um, but just so you know, in general, we, we want students to get paid placements. So many benefits, you already know these. You know that employers want a degree and work experience. Um, you know that there are positive uh, skills benefits that you get out of a work placement. You've heard about it today. And you also know already that it's supported by student finance. So it means that um, when you're out on placement, you are still considered a student. And that means that you have obligations both to your workplace and to us at City. Um, and we're going to ask you to do a series of assignments throughout your year. Uh, which are going to benefit you in your learning and at the end. And uh, with a touch on it today, we ask you to do the employability award application right at the end. Um, and we've had so many students in the last year who've gotten gold awards um, because they've done such amazing work with their skills development on placement. If you are an international tier four or student visa student, um, you can work full time while you're on this program, which is really, really nice. Um, which is a bit different to normal uh, studies at university. So where do our students end up? They work right across the job sector, every job sector. So we have students who've been in private or commercial organisations. Human resources is a really popular place for students to end up when they go on placement. And these are almost always paid placements. Um, recruitment is a popular one. Learning and development, so working on training programs for organisations. Um, working on uh, internship programs. So when uh, organizations want to actually create these programs and uh, recruit students into their organization, um, they'll get an intern to help with that. Um, we've also had students doing business development, so sales and marketing. Um, of course, NHS placements, uh, students who want to do um, you know, the clinical psychology type of roles. We've had students in schools and also in the charities that you've heard about today. So uh, what to do next to secure a placement? Um, Bernie's telling you over here, um, use all of the careers resources that are available to you. Um, there are so many here at City available to you, not just in our team, not just in your department. You have Careers Hub. Um, there's so much there. There's Experience City. You have uni temps if you want to get some um, shorter term paid work. There are online job boards, um, organization websites that will advertise positions. And of course, the emails that we send out and we post on our LinkedIn, um, because we get um, approached by organisations who want to keep using our students, because we have great students uh, at City. So in terms of timing, um, we are coming to the end of the recruitment period now for next year for commercial organisations, which is not to say that they won't keep recruiting, because 
COVID has created a little bit of an interesting timeline for organisations. They tend to be recruiting for a longer period, um, but normally they're completed by December. For the NHS or charity uh, type roles, um, they're recruiting right now and right into next year. So you'll have until May um, to uh, see about those ones as well. So keep an eye on your emails, make sure you're searching online um, and something will pop up. So Careers Hub. This lovely lady here on the right hand side, this is Antonia Clark. She is our careers consultant. She is your careers consultant um, and she's really, really helpful. Um, you should meet with her, jump into an appointment, either career planning or career advice if you're not sure what you'd like to do or you'd just like to chat with someone about your options. Um, she can help you with mock interviews uh, once you've actually secured an interview. And I'd encourage you to get as much practice as possible because your, the way that you talk about your skills uh, in an interview is the difference between getting that job or not getting that job. Um, you can also get application checks. So when you're initially putting in that application, get it checked first before you submit it. It makes the biggest difference. Um, and of course, uh, you can get your CV checked as well. And I'd encourage you to do that. Um, Careers Hub also has uh, a lot of events that you can go to if you're sort of trying to find out what it is you're interested in, and they have a job board. They post um, internships and placements on there as well, so make sure you keep an eye on that. Experience City, if you don't know, is City's website for all things employability. It's a one-stop shop for you, and it is um, a hub for you to access the volunteering website, uni temps, um, you can access leadership programs. So just uh, click one of the, the links on the right hand side, I want to gain business experience and it'll bring back a list of things that you can get involved with to do that. So you don't need to think too hard, you can jump straight in. I'd encourage you to use that website. Of course, online job boards, you're gonna get uh, really, really experienced in searching for placements online. LinkedIn jobs, as was mentioned before, is a great place to look. Um, rate my placement, prospects and milk round. Um, you're going to need to get very clever about what you search for. Um, so I would recommend that you find a job that you would like to have in the future and then search for that job title with internship or placement at the end and just see what comes up. Um, sometimes being more specific will get you exactly what you're looking for. And also start contacting organisations directly. If you're applying for a job that you see advertised online, you're going to have a lot of competition. If you apply for a job by sending out an email to an organisation and asking them if they've got something available, you will have very little competition for that role and your chances of securing that are much higher. So I want you to get really comfortable with reaching out to organisations that you want to work for um, to create your own opportunities. Um, so you can create an email uh, and look on their website to find out who the contact person might be. You can also do some sleuthing by looking on LinkedIn. That's what it's there for. Find someone in HR that you can contact or perhaps the CEO's name um, and send an email directly to that person. Um, you just never know what you might get back. You may not get a response, but that's okay. And of course, our emails. We try to send out all of the jobs that we get uh, sent to us uh, via email uh, to our students. And this is what they look like on the right hand side there. Um, there's usually some emoji in the subject line as we try and vie for your attention. We know you get a lot of emails. So um, make sure you always look at our emails because we try and make them as valuable for you as possible. Um, as it says, organisations will contact us directly and we will send those to you. These are, this is another kind of placement that is much easier for you to get because the pool of applicants is going to be so much smaller. It's not open to everybody. Um, and most of the roles um, that we do get contacted about are exactly the kind of roles that you're looking for. These are the social care and NHS roles. Uh, so keep an eye out in your email. So what to do for success uh, is my final point. Um, read our Moodle. The SAS placements Moodle talks about the whole program and exactly what it is you're, you're going to be looking for. Um, and what you need to keep an eye out in terms of timing and that sort of thing. Um, put your, your CV together and put it through the VMOX system on Careers Hub. Make sure you get it checked and it looks great. If you don't have work experience, please try and get some volunteering just an hour or two a week. Uh, will help you when you start applying for these roles. A placement for next year. 
book in with Antonia, get that, get that started because the momentum will help you keep going. Um, start searching for placements online and reaching out to organisations that you would like to work for directly and get that interview practice um, once you've actually secured an interview because it really does make the biggest difference. And the more you practice, the more you'll feel confident just talking about the things that you've done and the things that you can do. So um, finally, please don't give up. Um, sometimes this is a numbers game. Just keep reaching out. And um, we, this is what we find anyway, is that the students that persevere get something in the end. So if this is for you, keep going. Um, and I think we've probably got another page. So this is uh, not something I expect you to read right now. This is a little cheat sheet I put together with all things for placements uh, for you to look at. And if I can draw your attention to the right hand side, I have a little uh, approvals um, process for placements. So secure an eligible placement. We have a form that we're creating now that's in Moodle that uh, we want you to complete for conditional approval of your placement. And that just makes sure that it's an eligible placement and that everything's in place. Um, we will add you to a Microsoft team after that. And all of the paperwork you need to complete is in that team with instructions. And then you submit that work in Teams once it's all complete. The deadline is the 30th of June next year. If you feel like you might go past that deadline, get in touch with us by email um, because we can often make exceptions for you, um, especially if you are communicative and you stay on top of it. Um, if people drop off the radar, we forget about them. So um, make sure you're very communicative about that. And also, once everything's approved, we'll send you an email so you know for sure that you have had your placement approved and then you can go out on placement. So that is it in a nutshell. Um, thank you very much for listening and uh, get in touch if you have any questions about this. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you so much. Yes, I think I would love to add two things to that. I think the one thing is, um, <clears throat> from my experience, yes, that a, like you can get stuff till the summer. I think sometimes it happens later, sometimes it happens earlier. Don't give up if you don't find something. And I think if you have something that's a little bit different, I think Paul, Fiona and I will always try to make it happen. I think we have some people who split their placements or do other things, or can they supplement one with the other and so forth. So because we are so pro placement, I think we're very much in favor of making it work for you. So if you have very something specific that you feel like mm, it doesn't fit quite into the framework, just contact us and we'll try to make it happen. Um, I think, yes, uh, I can't, I think Vida said it in the chat, Yes, you, we will understand you and we'll try to make it happen. Um, and I think that's really important to kind of know. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much, Fiona. That was great. Um, I think I would just open the floor now for questions. I think we went a little bit over time. If you have any questions in general, I think it's always good to start with you, Fiona. Um, and I think if something pops up that either Paul or I should answer it and Fiona asks us and then we we figure that out. Um, yes, and I think the other thing I also say, if you know somebody who did a placement that you would like to know, I think contact them. Uh, uh, that's also good. I think as, uh, students really are helpful. You're nice people. And if somebody asks you, hey, how did you actually do it? Then uh, you will more often than not get some great advice. Uh, and I often contact former students and say like, hey, uh, how, did, uh, how did you do that? I have a student, did they need advice? And then I, that's how I learn about these process. Okay, um, so there's one question in the chat, if it's possible to do a placement at a psychiatric hospital, very much. Um, I think you, it's within the NHS, you need to find a placement, um, but that is something. Um, yeah, so I think there's another question in the chat about um i think if you're in the first year this is great i think we hoped it to, we hopefully read it your appetite you should have that on the radar and um but it is after your second year sometimes i get the question whether you can do a placement after your third year um which but then you basically would just like get your degree and then do your voluntary work or whatever you want to do uh thereafter so you, it has to be between your second and your third year as much as I'm aware of, I think 
Fiona, that's like 99.9% .9 correct, right? That's right. That's, that's <laughs> okay. right. So um, I'm just having a little look at the questions. Um, and if you are in first year right now, your priority should be to get some experience if you possibly can, because this is going to set you up for next year when you actually start applying for placements. Um, so volunteering is a great place to start. Um, sometimes students who just use their part-time job, as long as you can draw out the transferable skills from your part-time job and use those for your placement um, application, you can get a, a fantastic placement. Um, but yes, please try and get something that's semi-related to what you'd like to do now. That, that would be your priority this year. Did you say that, Andreas? Yes, unfortunately, some of the, I think, um... Uh, Aura and um, Simran, for instance, did a placement that's quite competitive. Uh, some of the really like uh, honorary system psychology roles are quite competitive. I don't know why my dog starts to whine in the background. There's probably a really good reason. Um, so I think it's good to have a little bit of experience. And I think the moment you have a little bit of experience, you can immediately tell um, in an interview, because you have so much of like a richer understanding from what you're drawing um, uh, when you talk to people. So I think, yes, if you can, I, I mean, I'm all about work experience. I think if you're in your first year and you kind of feel like you're settled in and you're not overwhelmed and you feel like, well, I have time, do work experience in any case, whether it is for the placement or not, just go out and do something. In the summer, you can always do something in the summer. Um, it's so good. Um, okay. So yes, um, Fiona, can you talk a little bit about student finance? So how does that work? Um, yep. Yep. So if you're currently um, accessing student finance, it works exactly the same way. It's uh, You can get your tuition fees covered. Um, we do charge a nominal fee for placement year. It's actually much reduced. Um, we just cover the administration of the program, so you're not paying for the, the large amounts that you would if you're coming to university every day for classes. Um, in terms of your maintenance loan, it is means tested. So what happens is when you secure a placement, if it is unpaid, we'll provide you with a letter on letterhead um, that you can submit with your application. And when you apply for student finance, you just need to tell them that you're doing a sandwich year program or a placement year program, whatever it says in the, in the application. They will ask you for this additional information and then they will work it out based on what you're getting paid. Um, we do need a job description though um, to be able to produce that for you. They seem to be um, making it more and more stringent each year about the evidence that we need to provide to them um, to sort of prove what it is you're actually doing. So give us as much information as possible once you've secured that placement. Yeah, um, so, oh, sorry. Right. Yeah, I think, yeah, in general, I think the kind of rules that are correct, if you do NHS or charity, you don't get paid. If you do something else, you get paid, right? So I know of like once one of my personal duties, she did it because she wanted the money. So she wasn't really, yes. she was like, oh, I could use the money for a year. And she did it. So this is like, um, yeah, I think my, that's kind of the, the rule of thumb, right? Yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah, I mean, it's great if you can get a paid placement, but if you've got your heart set on clinical psychology, chances are that's not going to be paid and you're going to need a maintenance loan to, to help you oh. with your expenses. Okay. Um, the other thing is if you decide to work in a school, um, uh, it's student finance is quite strict with um, providing money when it comes to, uh, I'm not sure how they work it out or why they do this, but if the school is funded a particular way, like from the local authority, they, you don't qualify for a maintenance loan, but if it's they're funded by um, a different organisation, you do. So just be really careful. Make sure you know exactly what it is that you're getting into before you're taking a, um, a placement in school, if that's what you'd like to do. Yeah, I think also one of my former personal tutors also, he worked for four days and then he, on the fifth day, he would actually work at Argos to kind of, and sometimes on a weekend, there was a very intense process. I have like a ton of questions. I would, if that's okay, that we kind of uh, uh, sent to me, I would just go in uh, kind of chronological order. Um, I think one really interesting question is um, how disabilities are taken into consideration when finding a placement. Is there something that we're, you know, we can figure out, like, is, is that taken into account? How does that play into that? Um, we ask students to disclose this on their tri-party agreement. Um, they don't have to if they don't want to, but we can't, we can't help you if you don't. 
Um, and we would hope that you would be registered with the Disability Service at University. Um, we will do all we can to help you um, in that search, um, but we would also expect that any prospective employer would take that into consideration as well as part of your, um, you know, your setup at work, for example, perhaps you need special adjustments made. We would want them um, as part of that arrangement to, to look after you. Um, we're not going to put you into a, a difficult or dangerous situation. Um, so just communicate and let us know what you need. Yeah, I think in the NHS, that's probably something they're equipped most often to kind of, yeah, I think yeah, the bigger the organization, the probably the better they're prepared. That would be my kind of, uh, um, but uh, please don't let that stop you. Um, placements abroad, I think there's more, there's one about placements abroad. I think Malak did her placement, I think in Dubai, right? Uh, so it's definitely uh, doable and it can do it. Um, Fiona, like how how's uh, like what do you have to keep in mind if i want to do my placement in hawaii so <laughs> take appropriate clothing <laughs> um so i would say so we have we, we we don't say that we won't allow students to do this you absolutely can do this COVID has created a difficult situation in that there are additional risks for the university and we want to make sure that students are okay um and so we have been approving only international placements where it's your home country, because you know it, you've probably got family there. Um, it's less of a, a culture shock element to that because there are additional um, life skills stuff that you have to do if you're moving to another country for, um, for work or study. Um, having said that, if you really want to do it, come and talk to us and we will uh, walk you through those considerations. We just want to make sure that you're going to pass your year. That's our priority. We want you to have this experience and we want you to do really well. Um, so if you find something that interests you, uh, come, and, come and chat to us about it because we can actually approve placements that are international. Um, right. You might also get a bit of funding for it. The Turing scheme has just come out and it does cover work. Um, we have no detail yet about no. um, any kind of funding levels, but we're hope, hopefully going to find out soon. Um, but, but that is also there for exactly this kind of scenario. Okay, that's fantastic. I think, yeah, the emails I get about the Turing scheme are very vague, I feel like. We're doing it. It's happening. <laughs> Wait for more. Okay. We're still waiting. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think uh, uh, one question that would be good for Paula me to answer um, is about what should I do if I want to uh, get a research assistant role. So this is a kind of interesting question. When I was at Oxford, um, Oxford University, we had every year in our lab there uh, a placement student and they would work for free. Uh, uh, and one year in our lab and work as a research assistant. I think it was amazing. It was amazing for them. It was amazing for us. I think city. Um, so and I know that other people are doing this. So other universities are doing it. So ideally, if you want to become a research assistant and you're not thinking about like research assistant within the NHS, these roles exist too. I think one of our students um, I think I, I uh, remember is was a research assistant within the NHS, I think for the placement, if I'm informed correctly, uh, and um, I can connect you. But I think if you're kind of like, if you want to become uh, a person like Paul or me, if you want to become a lecturer, I think Vida kind of uh, alluded to it. The best thing you can do is a placement and do it in a lab in a university. Um, and um, so these ex they exist. The way we um, did that is basically that people approached us. Um, so I always say, like, if you're interested in getting research experience, the first thing you should do is you should look at a place or like somebody who does research that you care about, that you're interested in, and contact them. And um, kind of in your email, express that you care about their research, not just, I think I get often emails and I'm interested in your work because I like social psychology. So I know they don't care about me. They just kind of like, you know, make it specific. But then um, it's more often than not you will get answers. And um, I think a lot of people are happy if you're coming like, hey, I want to work in your lab for a year for free to make that happen. I don't know, Fiona, you're like, um, is that something that happened in the past? I know that's like, I don't know. Um, I try to get students in uh, into my lab, but it was a little bit more difficult at City than I uh, experienced it at UCL and at um, Oxford. 
Yes, I, I don't know why this is, but it's it doesn't seem to be a clip, an easy pathway for hiring research assistants in this way. Um, I don't know why. Yeah, yeah, I'm not, yeah, <laughs> so, uh, but that's kind of, yeah, if you want to do that, okay. Uh, yes, I see uh, Simran has to leave. Um, thank you so much, Simran. Uh, and I can only, she says, like, contact me if anyone has a question. I think she's uh, quite active on, uh, I think you're doing uh, some stuff on Instagram and on LinkedIn, and she's an amazing resource. So, and a wonderful person. Just if you have a question, ask Simran. Um, Malak says, yes, do it in a, in a different country. Um, that sounds very good. Yes, okay. And UCL, gosh, okay, research assistant. One of my friends did that last year for placement. I think they were Somalia, right? And, um, yeah. and um, I think she really liked it. So, yes, um, they're also within the NHS research assistant roles. Um, so, uh, that's a little bit different. Um, you know, that's like, yeah, it's kind of research, not really research in my point, from my point of view, but Paul would probably think very differently about that. Um, so yeah, but it's a little bit different being a, um, um, yeah, being a research assistant within the NHS versus being a research assistant um, outside the NHS. I think this is a little bit different. It depends a little bit on your career goals. Happy to talk more about this if anybody is interested in. I think this was the least successful event I ever organized, how to become a lecturer. So I, will not, so, I think there were more lecturers than students present, so I, I will not do this again. <laughs> yeah. okay. um, I think um, the numbers are twindling. If you have any questions, I mean, now you can see, you saw our faces, you see Paul, um, you see Fiona, we are all quite, um, I think at least Paul and Fiona are quite lovely people. So please contact them. And I think we're, so yes, we really wanna make it happen. We'll try to figure out a way um, to um, kind of get you on your placement and uh, don't give up. I think persistence, just keep on going. Um, yes, thank you everyone. Thank you to Paul, thank you. Fiona uh, for staying on that late and um, talk to all of you soon. Bye. Thanks, Andreas. Thanks, everyone.